Hi, Paul. Well, here we are. And uh, we today are. it's going to be Botticelli and depth psychology and all of the implications of working with that in depth. So this could be quite a ride. And James is going to do some amazing graphics, which yeah. he's very, very as good at. As he always does. As he yes. always does. Yes. So uh, good luck, everyone, and hope you enjoy. Yeah. In the words of Steve and Pauline Richards, creative writing, music and art are all responses to the human instinctive pressure to create. Although their surface structure representations differ, they all have one thing in common. They are superpositioned with a deep structure narrative. The Renaissance was a time in which human potential unleashed itself, producing the most distilled representations of consciousness the world had hitherto ever seen. As we mentioned in Rebirth of the West, our world today is on the cusp of a new Renaissance, the necessary field reversal to our cultural catabolism. The truth of who we are has already been laid out by the masters of the past. Let us step back in time for a moment to learn how we can reorient for the future. Today we will be unpacking the deep structure representational psychodynamics behind three paintings by the Renaissance artist Sandro Botticelli. The Birth of Venus, Primavera and Palace and the Centaur. The first two lay claim to being amongst the most famous in history, truly fascinating to generation upon generation of critics and historians. And therein lies the hint. To become arrested by an image, paralysed by projection, is to become trapped at a doorway. To pass through is synonymous with understanding. To lay all personal complexes aside, and allow the superpositioned platonic to meet us from within. Everything in this video comes directly from the work of my mentors, Steve and Pauline Richards, and their 43 years of frontline clinical experience each. All of this video's content derives from recent very high-level seminars Steve and Pauline presented as part of their professional training course in psychosystems analysis. Let us begin, first of all, with an introduction covering all of the necessary theory to understand before moving on to Steve and Pauline's dialectic unpacking of the true meaning of the three paintings. Let us begin. Someone who is yet to encounter their own creativity might believe that authentic art is carefully created by the ego. This is not true. The ego certainly plays a role at the point of delivery, but the form is generated by the field of the person. That is, their so-called unconscious. Thus, to understand it, we need to approach it through appreciation of what Steve and Pauline have termed representational psychodynamics. To use their metaphor, let us consider a work of art like Botticelli's Venus as being like a dream, a visual narrative in which nothing is hidden. Everything is right in front of you, but the meaning is latent. Hence, it requires conscious unpacking, just as one would do with a dream. Rather than going straight to the representations within the painting, we should first begin with the context, everything that is superpositioned within the artist's field. To state the obvious, Sandro Botticelli was a man, yet this is a fact very often ignored in much interpretation. He was a man, let it be said, who was born circa 1445 and spent the vast majority of his life in the Republic of Florence during the Renaissance. Both of these facts, Botticelli's biology and the times in which he lived, need to be considered first. By means of Steve and Pauline's meta-framework for this, the platonic field, the ontological, organising, informing field of superpositioning information, 
underlies the form of the genome and organises its molecular and field-level relational dynamics. The genome's algorithmic so-called intent is the expression of platonic information through evolved psychobiology. Practically, this entails the ontogenetic unfolding of the anticipations of the lifespan, solving first the Freudian, or instinctive, and Adlerian, or psychosocial, imperatives of adaptation. Along the way, this inevitably involves the generation of complexes. Successfully navigating this, however, what Jung termed the task of the first half of life, is not synonymous with a ceasing in the development of personality. The superpositioned platonic pressure continually pushes towards the limits of its telic completion in any one given person. That is, for the person to become as conscious as possible. This is the informational landscape, described in great detail in our Rebirth series on Jung to Live By, that informs the superpositioning of psychodynamics into creative representation. So, right at the core, the platonic field organises the meta-instincts, including both molecular genomic and Sheldrakean field-level representations as the wellspring of creative expression. This meta-instinctive information contains the superpositioned telic aim of the platonic intentionality of the lifespan. Thus, a perception of this can be gleaned through working through the surface structure representations of, as per Botticelli, the paint on canvas. Steve and Pauline discuss exactly what the specific meta-instinctive representations in the three paintings are in the dialectic part of this video, but before we get there, we need to discuss something absolutely essential. Along the way of creative expression onto the canvas, that platonic information would have had to have passed through the field of complexes, both personal and cultural, superpositioned together. Although the Renaissance was a time of immense creative development, it was heavily presided over by the Catholic Church. Artwork that was considered in any way to potentially entice one towards sin was not allowed. It's believed that Botticelli himself came under literal fire for this. It's reported that many of his mythological paintings were burned in the Bonfire of the Vanities in 1497. Botticelli, like many of his contemporary artists, would thus have to have disguised what he was doing under Darwinian survival pressure from the church. Hence, as is most obvious in Primavera, it's possible to see surface structure features that were probably placed there as a nod to the cultural pressure of the time. Venus appearing at first glance to be Mary-like, the posture of her body, the gesture of her hand, the apparent halo behind her carved into the trees, it's just enough to encourage anyone raised in Catholicism to immediately project such things into the painting, perhaps seeing the rest as just some kind of medieval-style allegory for sexual morality. And thus, Botticelli preserved the deep structure intentionality. The same nod must also have been given to any patronage, most notably from the Medici family, the de facto rulers of Florence. Again, in Primavera, one can see the presence of oranges in the composition, a symbol of the family, and it's been noted that the figure of Mercury on the left might have been modelled after one of the Medicis. Similarly to the Catholicism of the time, Botticelli's creativity would have to have adapted on the surface to this powerful psychosocial force. The meta-instinctive information comprising creativity would have to have passed through personal complexes too. 
Fundamentally, this means personal learning and associations, not distorting the deep structure intentionality of the creativity. For example, Botticelli was more than likely familiar with the account of the birth of Venus from the ancient Homeric Greek tradition. This describes Venus as being blown to the seashore by the winds of Zephyrus, and upon arrival, being clothed by the Hori. One can certainly see these elements in the painting, but to presume Botticelli was somehow just illustrating a scene from myth necessarily causes one to suppress all other elements which are not present in the original story. Who, for example, is this female figure, subtly exhaling, in contrast to Zephyrus's gust of wind? The same is true of Primavera. The right-hand side of the painting and the presence of the graces appears to be directly lifted from the Roman poet Ovid. The nymph Chloris is abducted by Zephyrus, and through their union she is transformed into Flora, who lives in a magnificent garden of flowers. Again, however, what of the rest of the painting? as a clear narrative from right to left that is not present in Ovid's story. If we take all of this together, then the activation chain of his creativity would have looked like this. The platonic field organises the superpositioned information comprising the male meta-instincts, which moves towards the ego through the field of complexes. We can see that Botticelli certainly put his own complexes aside, only keeping in the bare minimum necessary as an adaptive nod to his environment. To get past any shallow interpretations of his work, we too need to put any tendency for projection to rest. The surface structure is merely a gateway to the representational psychodynamics, at core the platonic teleology of the development of consciousness as such. One of the ways Botticelli succeeded in distilling out the platonic driver of his creativity was to invoke his muse. Artists of all kinds have always had muses. Their inspiration, whom they have always known, are the true so-called source of creativity. What this means, technically, is that if a muse is a real-life woman, then from the man's perspective, she is an external anima psychopomp. Simultaneously, she instantiates and emits the platonic form of the feminine, which is received by the man, and the man projects his genome's own platonic form of the feminine onto her. To quote from Steve Richards, this instantiation of the platonic form from a woman can manifest as a waveform, appear and disappear, leaving an otherwise ordinary canvas. This dip in the waveform can often invite a further projection from the man, as his psyche, his genome, and the contiguous field that all men share seeks to find the platonic image on the surface of the canvas. This field resonance between the man's psyche and the platonic form of the feminine acts to deliver pure, distilled information between inner and outer. The anima as the relating function, when working properly, as in such cases, brings ego and field into deep communion. In both The Birth of Venus and Primavera, it's very likely that the likeness of Botticelli's muse, Simonetta Vespucci, is present. However, it is most likely that Vespucci passed away before either painting was completed. Thus we see a clear consciousness in Botticelli of the difference between the platonic form and a real-life woman. He would have been well aware that his creative relationship to her form was separate to her as a person, and that her physicality was essential for initially delivering the platonic form into so-called material reality. Knowing this, let's flesh out our previous schema with more detail. 
This time, bringing in two what we learned from Steve and Pauline about the special case Ego Qualia of intuition, from our video AI, Intuition and Plato. The superpositioned creative wellspring of the meta instincts formed itself a priori to ego consciousness, orchestrated by the Platonic field. It initially travelled towards Botticelli's ego on the carrier wave of intuition. Intuition, although capable of representing itself to itself, is not capable of representing itself to the ego. It must always collapse into a different qualia of representation. For Botticelli, this would have been both sensory, as in internal images, and affective. Thus, the initial drawings of the paintings would have been completed, a plan through imagination as a way station to the finished product. Complexes inevitably would have tried to constellate through energetic innovation by the intuition, but Botticelli was clearly very careful to set them aside, essentially aided in this process, without a doubt, through the presence of his so-called positive anima, represented by internal sensory representation by the figure of his muse. Behind this representation, superpositioned with it, was intuition, which carried meta-instinctive and ultimately platonic information. Again, all superpositioned together. We know Botticelli was influenced by Neoplatonism. Learning this, as it would have been for anybody, would first of all have been cognitive. Yet nothing is contrived or stereotypical in the finished paintings. Thus we can infer that whatever Botticelli learned via his Neoplatonism acted as an external prompt for a working through of inner knowing. Now. We are ready to move on to Steve and Pauline Richards' full exploration of the three paintings, starting with the birth of Venus. So what, what do you think about the suggestion that Botticelli's Venus is actually a self-portrait? Because it's been suggested about other artists in the Renaissance too, mm. such as Leonardo da Vinci and his Mona Lisa, and also Cellini's sculpture of Perseus and the Medusa, there is a suggestion that all those artists invested something of themselves and their own psyche into their work. So given yeah. that Botticelli was a, a man and, and, and that's so important because these are a man's paintings, mm. what, what would you say? Well, I, I think that really cuts to the, the quick really of what, from a depth psychology perspective, we need to understand about this. At a very superficial level then, um, if he's painting himself into a picture, we could interpret that as being narcissism. But that is a superficial layer, of course. Yeah. Um, as you've uh, told me, he was informed uh, by Neoplatonism. That's right, yes. So he, was under, he would have understood Plato. Yes. Uh, he was thriving in a, a, a specific cultural and political yeah. environment. Yes, yes, um, that's true. Which meant that he, he had to be careful what he represented. Yeah. He had to give the nod to Catholicism, basically, didn't he? He uh, did. Whatever yeah. he did, it, they, he had to at least do yeah. that. Yeah. And you were telling me about the bonfire of the vanities. That's right. Yes. Which was the basically destruction of his non-Christian, most of his oh, non-Christian. Oh, yes, went uh, that way. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. So at a superficial level, and painting himself into his pictures could be considered narcissism. However, if we look at it at a Jungian level, on our way back to Plato, mm. um, because Plato is antecedent, mm. of course, um, mm. and uh, a big influence on Jung, then we could say that there's an element of his anima that's appearing, the classical Jungian anima, particularly in the uh, the Imago of Venus, in Botticelli's Venus. Mm. And uh, you've told me, Paul, about how that's been demonstrated through various art historians yeah. and art critics yes. to do with the arrangement of the face. And that's it was right. a, a kind yeah. of a feminised version, yeah. you said to me, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, well, it is. We've actually done this kind of thing ourselves in so much as uh, in Rebirth of the Feminine, we actually put an image of Venus alongside Freyland. The actress. The yeah. actress. Yeah. 
And you, you can see almost straight away that there are similarities in the two faces, even down to the angle of the head and the shape of the neck, the way the head's arranged on the neck. There, there, there is a lot of overlap. And similarly, it's been suggested that that's the case too for Botticelli himself and the representation of Venus. And yeah. if you do put, do the same thing, you put the two images alongside one another, I think it is possible to mm. see where there is oh, overlap. Yeah. Yeah. So again, the shape of the, the eyes, uh, one of the eyes is, is a little bit lazy. I think it's the right eye. There's a, a curl in the lip, which is mirrored in the, the, the Venus representation. You've got the wavy hair, you've, you, you've got the strong chin. There's lots of similarities in the face. So as you look from one to the other, you can see. Mm. So I think it is plausible. Yeah. So it's plausible then that we see what could be considered still superficially as being uh, the representation of himself in a feminized form. Yes. Right. So that's on the surface and that belongs with narcissism as a consideration for something like that. Mm. But someone who's informed by Plato mm. uh, and from our perspective, retrospectively looking back, yeah. people who are informed by Jung, they will see a deeper potential representation uh, pretty much immediately that um, given that Jung stated that a man's uh, soul was feminine mm -hmm. um, and that most of his unconscious was feminine, and I know there are arguments why that's overstated, mm -hmm. nevertheless, there is the representation, according to Jung as well, of yeah. the, the representation of the anticipation of the feminine that's born into men. Yeah. So therefore, when he, he paints himself feminized, then he's seeing that aspect of himself as conflated with the representation of himself yes, yes. right so yeah. there's that element there but also in that picture there are three in total there are three women there yes. are three women and yeah. the one on the right you've, you've informed me looks quite similar to his actual muse yes that's right it's, yeah simonetta vespucci yeah yes although the suggestion is that she wasn't present when he painted Right. The painting. So, so that's interesting. So that, that's come from an art critic or yes, a historian. It has. Yeah. So psychodynamically, you would put a different interpretation well, it, on him on him not being present. Well, uh, yes, I yeah. yes I would. Yeah. I think the thing is that actually that that goes against um, the orthodoxy really in terms of the interpretation, but it is an, an interesting angle nonetheless. And I think we've we've talked about this idea uh, with artists of responding to both inner and outer representations, whether yeah. the artist is a man or a woman, that you can access a, re a representation on the inside as well as the outside. So in, in a practical sense, it's entirely plausible that he could and would have done that. Yeah. I mean, he would only have to have that inner representation of his outer muse sufficiently distilled yeah. in his own mind as yeah. an imagination to be able to do that. Okay. It wouldn't so, be difficult. So. What does the muse represent then psychodynamically for an artist, a male artist? Well, <laughs> she says inspiration. Yeah, yeah. So if she's present in the painting in representational form, but was not present when the painting was done, mm. and following on from what you said, yeah. which I think is absolutely right, yes. um, she is nevertheless present. Mm. So that would define her imago as superpositioned uh, within his consciousness and within the painting, even though she wasn't there, yes. she is there she is. because what she represents is there. Mm. And there's another projection of the feminine that's going in. And yeah. I think that you told me about that when you you, you were you were describing the composition to me. Yeah. Was the actual action with her hand, in, right. including the posture of her hand yes. in the painting. So I wonder if you could remind me about that. Yeah, well, it's uh, looking on that particular representation. You you see a woman with with her, I think it's her right arm outstretched, as if she's holding a brush of some kind, and um, the flowing hair of Venus forms the bristles of the brush. So it's as if she is in fact painting the image of Venus herself. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So. As she is the representation of his inner muse, mm. but she's not physically there mm. when this painting was, was, was done. Nevertheless, the imago is there. That yeah. allows him to focus yeah. that which the representation represents within him that's his creativity mm. as being active within the painting. Yes. And he's demonstrating the act of painting mm. through that. Yeah. So the act of creativity itself mm. through his muse is represented mm. as the, the woman who is yeah. holding Venus's hair as if 
using a paintbrush. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, using that, the bristles. Yeah, yes, yeah. that's right. I think it's interesting too that the narrative sort of runs left to right as, as you're looking on at the painting. So the pink flowers that you see towards the left suddenly become the painted flowers on the right, yeah. on, on the flowing cloth on the right. So it's almost oh, yeah. as if we're moving from, from an unconscious place to a conscious one as oh, well, yeah. and because something, those flowers are then represented in, in a more material form. And I think that's probably interesting as well. OK, so we've got the movement from left to right. And left yeah. is traditionally considered to be the unconscious yes. side that's right. in a right handed person. Yes. So presuming that uh, Botticelli was right handed mm. and it is uh, the muse's right hand, which is. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, right. Yes. So uh, the two figures to the left, without going into any detail, uh, there's a movement of breath, but there's also a dynamic movement mm. because they're in the air. Yeah. They are in the air and communicating, moving the air yeah. and the petals are moving as well That's right. from the left. And they, they then settle on the cloth. Yeah. So that might be a kind of divine inspiration or represent intuition, yeah. which settles on the cloth, mm. which is the materiality of the yes. world from which the 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 muse it is projected mm. so almost as if the cloth were the canvas yes. to represent the yeah represent that which is emerging out from the unconscious yes so that movement then and the two figures involved male male and female they're conjoined because they're both holding one yes. another uh, will be important yeah so we, we contact them out yeah so it appears as if she's standing on a on a shell and yes. she, she's being blown towards the shore yeah now there is the Greek, the original uh, Greek myth about that, which I think is fundamentally disregarded in the painting. There's mm. much more that's going on in there other than on the surface. On the surface, it appears to be a representation of the birth of Venus yes. in myth. Yeah. But there are elements that are missing mm. that suggest it's not that. It actually represents something else. Mm. So again, we're into representational psychodynamics. Mm. And there is movement. And, and this figure has been projected onto the shore. Now, if she represents the so-called platonic form, mm. then she is insubstantial and immaterial yes. until she takes on the substance of existing in this world. And I think, as we've discussed, and, and you've pointed out to me as well, that the figures on the left are providing that. And the energy for that is coming from two sources. The masculine is blowing, isn't he? Yes. Really pushing very, yes. as if the motive force for the delivery into the it's world. It's very active, isn't it? It's yes. coming from him. And yes, that figure it is. You, you told mm. me it was Zephyrus? Yes, that's yeah. Zephyrus. Yes, yeah. the West Wind. The West Wind. Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so he's, he's very active. Yes. In that sort of traditional sense of the masculine principle being active. Yeah. Uh, but then there's a woman mm. um, and her mouth is open and she's more exhaling. That's true. Uh, and in, in the Greek perspective, anyway, pneuma, breath and yeah. soul are intimately linked. Are. So that could be the animating force which is being breathed into mm. the, uh, the platonic form, which is becoming substantial in this world. Yes. And there's, there's an important nuance here, which... I think we, we need to, to, to grapple with in mm. order to get where Plato is different to Jung, yeah. but at the same time gives us a very, very deep representation uh, based on an intuition that these artists and before them, the Greeks, yeah. must have understood oh, yeah. about how a form becomes substantial. Mm. So that, that's that element. So yeah. there's two, uh, two forms of, of movement of uh, one, which is motive to push, yeah. and the other which is imbuing with soul. Yeah. But that soul is not a masculine soul. That is, it is a woman that is breathing herself into the, the, the form of Venus yeah. and therefore bringing her to life. Yeah. And yet it also needs the act of creation of an individual male artist through his feminine side, through his muse. All of these things have to work together to make this happen. Yeah. And when that all happens together, what you have is consciousness. If we remove any of those elements, we will be unconscious. Those things will still be there, mm. but we will not know that they are there. Mm. So there's almost an Aristotelian element to this picture as well as a platonic one. There's a formal cause, a material cause, an efficient cause, and the final cause of consciousness, which is the superpositioning of consciousness into all of those simultaneous representational states that makes it real. Mm. 
absence of that, absence of the final cause, the other elements can be there, but they are not consciously represented. It takes the artist to be the efficient cause. It takes the form itself to exist in a preparatory state before it projects itself into matter. But in order for uh, the, the Jung's anima, considered platonically to take representational form, uh, it has to be imbued with the soul of a real woman. Which it is in his painting. Which it is in his painting. Yeah. Mm. So in other words, it's as if he is demonstrating the fact that he has cracked the code. Yeah. The Botticelli was conscious of the platonic form of the feminine in a way that even Jungians are not to this day, mm. because they have this tendency to get arrested by an image and that understand the dynamics, which all have to be superposition for this thing to be brought into, into actuality. So for a man then to perceive this in a woman, not only must the form be there, he must actively interact with it, but also something is emitted by the form through the materiality of an actual woman. Now that can lead, that can pull a man in to see into the material form of the living woman, which in this painting would be the woman who is breathing herself into the form to give it life. If that's not there, the man has to project it himself and it's, it's one-sided. If it comes from both and in the painting, that would be the artist and it would be the woman in the air who is breathing out. It would be Numa, the breath. Uh, both of those need to be there. Both of those need to interact with the form to make it real. And then we see it. And then there is consciousness of the instantiated platonic form of the feminine as perceived by a man and as uh, instantiated by an individual woman. Minus the soul of the woman, it's just like looking at empty air. There's nothing there. And the man projects into her. He projects inappropriately onto a blank canvas. Mm. But if the woman articulates that through her own soul, then the form comes into her and emits itself. And then the projection from the man and the reciprocal projection from the woman conjoin together. And then you have the complete picture. You have the instantiation at all levels. All of that superpositioning becomes conscious. And then that's what you have. So mm. as you've helped me to understand, that would be the uh, true instantiation of the platonic form through representational art. And it's encoded in there, but hidden at the same time. Well, it would be. And I think the important part there, Steve, is what you said about how the, all the elements have to be present mm. in order for that to happen. Yeah. And we see so often what happens, well, we see what happens when all the elements aren't there, mm. when men project on to women for yeah. whom the uh, platonic form of the feminine is, is not instantiated, mm. but because you know uh, those those two elements the 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 um you know the masculine psyche and, and the feminine soul aren't working together in a in such a way uh, that they can then make almost make the right assessment about what it is yeah. that they're projecting onto yeah then then we see the results of that which yeah. often are you know very yeah. sad and yeah, very, very disappointing. Sad. Yeah. Yes, yeah, that can happen. Yeah, it can happen. So you can have an incomplete instantiation. It's not on or off, is it? No. Yeah. Um, and this is uh, a young identified this. He was the first to give him absolute credit in the psychological and psychiatric field yeah. to appreciate the importance of an incomplete instantiation of that which is platonic. Yeah. Um, and people can do this by accident. You know, they, they don't want to. They're not looking to draw someone's attention. But a particular woman may not only look a certain way, but may actually instantiate the energy itself mm. that is latent within that form. And when that is not quite there, but nearly there, that's enough. Yeah. It's enough to draw people into, um, into an engagement with them and to attempt to fill in the gaps. And as you say, all the disasters can follow on yeah. from that. But the fact that the, 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 uh, the masculine element, which is represented by Zephyrus, yes. Now, some people identify him with Mercury, don't they, or Hermes? They do. Uh, which is interesting. Yes. Which is interesting. Because that mm. interpretation suggests that being the messenger of the gods yes. uh, and another kind of efficient cause that mm. starts at the beginning of the process mm. you know, um, is present. But if we think of that in the platonic sense of the, the soul being originally undivided, but separated into two halves that want to come together, that's probably an intuition about the very, very fundamental level uh, that exists within the platonic uh, realm of forms, 
yeah. uh, where these elements only become differentiated by being instantiated or projected into the material and therefore the psychological world as well. So you have the masculine and the feminine elements working together, represented by the fact they're holding one another, both using breath or emotive force in a yeah. different way. Yeah. Uh, the male principle, and this is not to make any judgment about the relative value or roles of them, but the male principle... Well, it's complementary, isn't it? Complementary, yeah. mm. uh, representing the probable actual force of instantiation of mm. information mm. into uh, the material world from the platonic, because it's a, a motive, it's, it's a motor force that is moving the form into place. Mm. So she arrives on the coast and mm. is like a statue until she is breathed into by the life force, by the soul, by the breath of an actual woman. And uh, when that is captured by an artist mm -hmm. consciously and in relationship to all of that, you will have a state of elevated consciousness of the true nature of the platonic. Yeah. And that goes beyond what most Jungians uh, have managed to distill out. The next painting then is again by Botticelli and it's uh, Primavera. Yes, which means springtime. Right, well, that, that's powerful immediately, isn't it, because of, because of what it suggests? Yeah, well, yeah. It, it, it certainly um, lays out the landscape, doesn't it, or or paints the the scene literally uh, on which, or the stage on which the actual figures in the painting appear. And there is a definite movement or metamorphosis a, in a, a metaphorical or allegorical sense of the idea of, spring the season spring appearing after winter and everything connected uh, or to do with the rebirth and and the the coming of new life in the spring and so on so that's a, that's interesting. It's, a, it's a journey through that right so in it, figurative it, form thank you so if we, we consider the frame of the image then yes where would you start the progression of the narrative from which which side of the picture well i think almost certainly from from right to left yeah and that is partly because of the composition of the, the painting itself. Mm. And one of the first things that you probably notice about it is, is that there's a little in the way of depth perspective. It, mm. it's, more, it's more gothic in its composition in that sense. Although an artist like Botticelli would have been more than capable of obviously of generating depth perspective. He would have understood, understood that completely, mm. but he's chosen not to do it here yeah. so we kind of we're kind of forced to move from right to left almost in a narrative form as if each figure in and of itself represents something part of the story and we move on from one figure to the next and so on as if as has been described by some as if they were a string of pearls oh, and yeah. each one of them you know is mm. linked uh, but also individually they're important as well right so the actual uh, the first drama, or first part of yes. the, the narrative drama that yes. then includes it. Zephyrus again in that? It's Zephyrus again, yeah. coming in from the right, the yeah. west wind, as I think we said uh, yeah. earlier. Yeah. And he's abducting Chloris, the nymph Chloris, Chloris meaning green, literally. So we've got the idea of, um, you know, uh, spring and growth and everything that the colour green can symbolise for us. And she's slightly overlapping with the next female, the third, third character in or figure in, who is Flora. She's slightly overlapped overlapped with her so we know that they are conjoined in some right, way. Right so she basically morphs into she Flora. Mor yeah she's a transitional She's a transitional figure, really. one. Yes. Can, I, can I ask now yes, if, we, if, we, if we go back to Zephyrus and Chloris then yes. they are in Botticelli's Venus that they, they are supposed to be yeah. the, the, the two figures in the that's sky right. that yes. we, we, we described before. So if that's the case then mm. and if the assessment of that in a depth psychological sense, that is the Botticelli's Venus picture is correct. Mm. Then we have the masculine and feminine principle mm. instantiated as such. Yes. As such within the world. Yes. And the element that's linking them uh, from what you've said, because uh, I know you've pointed out and it's in the picture mm. that um, Chloris is, has uh, green yeah, she does. shoots moving out, out from her mouth. She does, yes. Uh, and in that sense, 
she's very like the foliage heads yes. that you see around the Mediterranean and in Europe. Yeah. Uh, the foliage head was was common in Roman period, mm. in, in Roman period, male and female. Mm. Uh, the medieval one tends to be masculine. Yes. Uh, and it's not just the mouth, it's also the hair yes, and, and that as right. well. Yeah. But this is definitely a woman, mm. or a female figure, mm. that we can say has been morphed along in the, in the story, the narration mm. from Botticelli's Venus. Mm. Uh, and although they were conjoined originally in Botticelli's Venus, there's now something different. There's the active force, as you've described, it has mm. to do with, in mythic sense, an abduction. Mm. Uh, and then Chloris mm. going through an act of conjoinment yes. again yes. in material form mm. when they were originally joined together in mm. the spiritual or the platonic realm, mm. which produces flora. Yes. And flora's in a specific state, isn't she? Yes, she is. As I say, Chloris is a transitional figure. So in, in that sense, Chloris transitions into Flora, who is very visibly pregnant. Yeah. And that obviously has come about because of the abduction by Zephyrus. They're, they're conjoining, literally, uh, in that reproductive sense. Mm. And if again, if we I think you were saying earlier about we've got to be so careful about stripping away any kind of political yeah. interpretation or feminist interpretation of, of, of some of these things that what we because otherwise you know very unpleasant things start to creep in yeah. but if we see Zephyrus essentially as an elemental force who um and you've you've talked about this in other videos too this idea of um women being seeded by ideas yeah. as well yeah. uh, and and the importance of that and the, mm. for, the importance of the masculine principle in that way fertilized by words, fertilized by words. Yeah. sorry thank yeah. you yes that's yeah. right um obviously this, this is a different kind of fertilization but you it, it could it could be suggestive of, of that too because yeah. it's about not only a woman's um, reproductive or, or biological or meta instinctual development, it, it's about her developing as a person yeah. too. Yeah. So I, I think that that's um, yeah. I think I think that works. I think yeah. that's a, a viable way of, of, of interpreting it. Okay, thank you for that, Paul. So then, if they were conjoined together in Botticelli's Venus. Mm. And they were essentially undifferentiated principles that were complementary to one another yeah. in order to bring, in the case of uh, Botticelli's Venus uh, painting, uh, to bring the the representational form of platonic form of the yes. feminine into the world. Yes. They're now in a different relationship to the the drama, if you yeah. like, of, of that image, because they've they've separated mm. because they are material, mm. and then are conjoining again. That's true. And as a result of that. Uh, uh, conjoinment we mm. then get the uh, the morph morphic process where chloris becomes flora who is pregnant yes and then we have that movement through and it's in the springtime yes. which is a natural mm. regulatory cyclical process yeah which until recent times pretty much determined the whole cycle of a culture yes. and even our biology was linked very very closely to that yeah, yeah. so there's a separation and then a conjoinment once they become physical yeah. so we could say that the the male and the female who were blowing so to speak mm. and imbuing breath and soul mm. in the first uh, painting have themselves become physical yeah. and have been distributed into the world mm. and then become symbols again in their physical conjoinments yeah 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 and there's the maturational process of an individual woman there too there going, yeah, going through yes. the representation of her own springtime yes. her own fertility yes uh, and then becoming the mother role, which which would be Flora in this this sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes, I think I think that's all deeply accurate uh, and significant. I think that there are also parallels to with the idea uh, in Celtic traditions too of of the May Queen as well, oh, yeah, and the union yeah. of the May Queen and and the May King, mm. which are, are clearly is to do with uh, mating and relating yeah. and the lust drive and and natural meta instinctual processes unfolding for both men and for women. So you see this in so many traditions, yeah. but here in in Botticelli's painting. Yes, you see, you're seeing the transition of Chloris from this kind of female foliage head, as you, as you rightly pointed out, 
being uh, abducted and impregnated by Zephyrus, not necessarily uh, in a violent or an aggressive way, which no. is it's sometimes claimed yeah. uh, in some interpretations. Yeah. But I think it, it's more to do with the element of surprise because sometimes, for example, puberty certainly takes us yeah. by surprise. Does, yeah. Although we anticipate it, we're not always fully prepared for the changes that yeah. take place um, by psycho by psychosocially yeah. across the board. Yeah. And it would be easy to say that Zephyrus, you know, is abducting her and he rapes her and all of this kind of, of stuff. But I think we're actually moving away really from, from, from a deep structure, from a deep structure yeah. interpretation of things that we do yeah. that. Yeah. So, yeah, I would totally agree um, with that. Uh, it is a surprise. We mm. are prepared in advance yes. by our meta instincts for yes. that transition. Yes. But the the fact that something is growing that's living out from our mouth, mm. uh, it's it's a regurgitation, but it's it's not of something unpleasant. No, it's, it's no, life. It is it's life. It's a natural force emerges. Yes. Um, which, as you say, is it will be puberty, and she's looking over her left shoulder. Yes back at this dark figure mm. who you could interpret as being toxic masculinity and well, also you could very easily, some feminists have uh, yes. unfortunately done that they have whereas if he is that which is unknown yes and um, that that's that's such a common theme even youngians are, are, mm. are well aware of that mm. and the fact that he's the west wind and represents winter yes. the passage of winter yes um winter does in effect paradoxically seed spring it does uh, because without that rest in winter, yes, uh, the earth could not recover no, itself. There has follow to be that yeah, incubation yes. within a, a yes. natural cycle. Yes. Um, yeah. So all of that's yeah. presence. And then, as you say, you have flora. Yeah, you, you do. Just briefly about Zephyrus, of course, that he's deliberately painted in a cool colour palette yeah. in order to represent winter, as you, as you yeah. rightly say, uh, those cool tones. I mean, it's, yeah. it's so clever, really, yeah. isn't it? All these yeah. different uh, elements that go into that representation. Yeah. So anyway, yes, we have Flora. And again, if you look at the, the painting closely, you can see actually she's got flowers gathered up in a dress mm. with one arm, and she's actually scatter scattering those flowers with her yeah. other hand. So interesting, isn't it? It is, it? Yeah. yes. Because there's, there's the link with Botticelli's Venus and the movements of petals. Yes. Uh, which came with the breath. Yeah. Um, That's true. Yeah. Towards the artist. Yeah. So th there's so much moving in that, isn't there? So much energy that's going on. So yes. moving on then from yes, Flora. Yes, of course. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, to, to the next figure, yeah. female figure, who is apparently Venus herself again. And she is slightly um, back from the other characters. She's receding a little bit more into the background. And again, some interpretations, which, which a Christian overlays really suggest that the, you know, a kind of a halo effect made by the uh, trees in the background. Other people see other things depending on what they, they project into that psychologically. So it's like a raw sarge then? So it is very much like a raw yeah. sarge. And the suggestion is that she's a precursor to the Virgin Mary if we put a, a Catholic yeah spin yeah, yeah. or christian spin on they things. would do that they would they would do that they would superposition it they would yeah. and they do yeah yes yeah mm. uh, her posture's reminiscent of that it's very um, reminiscent of that yes but the uh the fact that she looks like she's recently given birth yes. is, is significant because that could be and was no doubt co-opted towards a, a christian interpretation of things that's exactly what's um, happened yeah. but the red flow of yeah. the cloth yeah. which you know it, it is involved as well and, mm. and all of that is important isn't it it's very important and, and even the hand gesture apparently in the painting um has been interpreted uh, as being similar to the Virgin Mary when she acknowledges the, pre the presence of the Holy Ghost, for example, uh, the idea of the Annunciation. So you, again, you can see that Christian overlay, but if, if we remove that interpretation, what we're left with is Venus, who looks more like she's postpartum than actually pregnant. Yeah. And the connection to that is the, the figure of Cupid, who in myth is her son, directly above her head who's firing the, the arrow down on yeah. the um you know so, the three nymphs so cupid basically is eros yes of yeah. course yeah 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 uh, and 
he's blindfolded and some people have suggested that love is blind mm. yes whereas we prefer indiscriminate yes yeah because natural things are indiscriminate they, are. they simply happen and yeah. we're, we're part of that environment and mm. it doesn't matter so much if that's the natural non-human environment mm. is indiscriminate mm. and how it affects everyone so too do drives uh, and genomic and field states to do with mm. that reproductive almost freudian drive yeah. as well yeah yes Yes. And uh, that could be considered from a Jungian perspective as well, because uh, the projection so-called mm. of anima, so-called and animus, so-called, mm. mm. is indiscriminate. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. It is literally hit and miss, isn't it? Sometimes and it's, it's where the arrow lands. And it's yeah. involuntary. Yes, yeah. of course. Yeah. So he's airborne. Mm. Uh, he looks like a cherub. He I think you've you pointed that mm. out. And therefore, there's a Christian element which has been placed on him. He looks less like a, a, mm. an idealised uh, Greco-Roman youth. Yes. And, and more like that now. So some of it, some of the 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 actual elemental force has been taken away. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it does represent the connection to Venus because mm. uh, Cupid or Eros is the son of Venus. That's right. Yeah. Yes. In yes. this context. In, the, in this yeah. context. Yeah. And, and that's important, isn't it, to keep it within context because yeah. Cupid has, you know, variously been represented as uh, older. Sometimes he, you know, he, he appears um, as a, an adolescent or, or a youth in, in some paintings, but Botticelli is obviously chosen to deliberately represent him as a cherub as you say yeah yes yeah, so that, that will keep it within the christian canon yes yes um, yes it would yeah, yeah. so yeah. The, the next characters as we move towards the left as we look at it there's the yeah. three graces yes the, there's yeah. the three nymphs who are based on mythologically based on the three graces and they are love beauty and chastity right hard sometimes to know which is which and 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 they are they do appear because they're dancing in yeah. a celebratory fashion celebrating uh you know um love and the joy of procreation yeah. and and so on yeah. they are obviously moving or yes. or it's that that's the insinuation oh, yeah. that's, is that they're moving we, we, we can see that yes yeah. we, we can yeah. see that and and the one as you as we look on who appears to be disengaged from that group, mm. it's suggested that that's chastity. Okay, and so, she appear appears to be looking towards Mercury, and the far side of the painting. Right. So returning, thank you, Paul. Yeah. Going back to the three graces, then. Yeah. If, if, if she is chastity, yes, then love and beauty are the other two. Yes. And if we be running that order from left to right, mm. just in an arbitrary yes, way, yes, of course, yeah. Then love, uh, if you look at the, the, the picture or look at the figure of mm. love, mm. Uh, as we're interpreting it within uh, Primavera, mm. there's a similarity yeah. between that and uh, the birth of Venus yes. image by Botticelli. Facially, she's very similar. Yeah. Yes. I, I, I would suggest, and mm. this is only me, no, no, it's that okay. the, the figure on the right, yeah. which is beauty, yes. perhaps, is close in profile shot to his muse. Yes. Yeah, I'd agree with that. So yeah. his, his capacity to love mm. re is represented by this feminized version of himself yeah. in the form of Venus as yeah. part of those graces. Yeah. Then beauty is the object of that which he's projected personally upon. Mm. And then there is chastity, mm. who is looking out of that circle. And above yes. them we have Cupid, who is aiming a blind shot, yes. an indiscriminate shot. Yeah. And um, some people we know have attempted to literally nail that, that shot down mm. onto chastity. Yes. Uh, whereas we could look at it differently and say it's indiscriminate. Yeah. Uh, it's a moving target. Yes. They're revolving around a common centre. That's true. Uh, and yeah. if you were going to stand the best chance of hitting someone, mm. you would need to have your aim focused somewhere upon that common point of, of revolution of the three women who are moving around. So it almost doesn't matter which one of them gets hit. Yeah. If indeed hitting one does not also simultaneously, because of their connection, hit all. Mm. Well, they are yeah. sisters. They are sisters. Yeah, mm. yeah. And anyway, he's got a quiver full of arrows, so he can he can keep firing can all keep day. Going. <laughs> yeah, ad infinitum, yeah. which is what happens. Yes, yes. Um, so in that sense, then he represents eros. Mm. In a Freudian sense, yes, it does. Uh, but also Eros in a Jungian sense of being animation, not just lust or passion, mm. but of animation. Without that energy, mm. there's nothing for love, beauty and chastity to do except revolve around its common axis. Yeah. There's no focus. It needs to be animated. It needs yes. to have the libido provided for by Cupid 
which then engages them. But the fact that chastity is looking out mm. is, I think, interesting too. Yes, well, it's been suggested that her eye is on the target of Mercury, who is at the very end of the painting, and he actually has his back to her. And with his staff, with his caduceus, he's actually parting the clouds, the winter clouds, in order to allow spring to arrive. Yeah. And you would have to say from that, he, he, he himself is completely disengaged from the character of chastity. My, my take on that, my view on that, and that's not just mine alone, other people have said it too, that chastity is in fact looking past him, looking behind him through the gap in the trees towards something else. Yeah. And that's something else for, for some people in some interpretations is another painting of Botticelli's, ah. which is Pallas and Athena. Right, I remember now you're saying. Which apparently continues on and completes the story or the narration of Primavera. Right, so I'm going to look at that shortly, aren't yes. I? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. So Mercury then, messenger of the gods. Yes. Uh, and in this case, the harbinger of spring. Mm. So he will be looking east. Yes, opposite to west that's true. so that gives us a perspective that means we're if east is on the uh, left mm. and west is on the right mm. then we are looking south from north yeah yeah oh, have i got that the right way around i think so yeah yeah oh, good yeah sounds right <laughs> to me i can see james nodding good good james is the scientist <laughs> he understands these things good <laughs> Whereas I might not know my left from my right, and therefore my east from my west. Actually, there's, there's some truth to that, but that's another story. Uh, yeah, so, but yes. the, the, the perspective is going to be important. So where are we meant to view this from? Mm. That's going to be significant as well, if mm. we can unpack that. Mm. So he's the harbinger of, of spring, yes. the messenger of the gods, therefore yes. of natural forces. Yes. And the whole thing then moves into relationship to one another as we pass across that. Yes. That, and then into the next narrative. Mm. Uh, yeah. But some people have suggested that he's a sexual image and mm. that chastity is looking at him That's right. in some kind of erotic sense because yes. of Cupid. Yes. Uh, mm. And I would say that says a lot more about the person making that judgment than, or, or the state of their own animation. Yes. Yes, indeed. Quite a few people actually have suggested that interpretation that they are another couple at the other end of the painting to kind of balance yeah. out Zephyrus and Chloris at Yeah, if the that other end. if that happens, yeah. then you've got a kind of judgment of Paris, then haven't you? Or mm. a reverse judgment of Paris where mm. chastity breaks away from love and beauty. Yes. As if to say love and beauty will act independently or should act independently of chastity, mm. and only Mercury should be chaste. Yes. Or should have the association to chastity, whereas Mercury does not have an association exclusively to chastity. No. If you take what Mercury is yeah. in alchemy, it's, it's, it's that the, the essential thing which makes mm. everything happen. Yes. The spirit Mercurius is that which, which represents intuition. It makes everything happen. Mm. That's why it's the messenger of the gods. It comes from the unconscious. That doesn't yes. work at all. Yeah. If, if, if those three are broken off from one another, mm. that's, going to, that's going to be problematic. Mm. And bearing in mind, as you told me, that that picture was uh, commissioned by the Medici. Yes, it was. To, to hang in a bedroom. Yes. To celebrate the nuptials of a marriage. Yes, that's right. The last was. thing you would want would be that to be broken. Yes. Yeah. Um, so yes. I don't think that that washes at all. Well, the, the perspective apparently at the time was that at the point at which the bride would have um, seen the painting hanging in the bedroom, uh, she would have already been married. Yeah. So, you know, what, what we take from that then on is, is important, really, yeah. isn't it? Because that yeah. would have been that would have been. Yeah. the message if you like the narrative yeah. to the married couple um in a form that would um maybe demonstrate to them what was important for yeah. relationships and for marriage and so on so chastity within a marriage represents fidelity yeah yeah so fidelity if there's an absence of fidelity mm. that's not good in any relationship because mm. there's no loyalty no trust yeah and then there's the biological consequences of that as well as psychosocial yeah and then on an individual level, um, it, if we can't, as men, work with that 
imago of the feminine going all the way back to the, the our first experience of our mothers mm -hmm. and how we relate to the unconscious mm -hmm. it's going to be very difficult to trust anything without collapsing into the ego because the ego would have to compensate for that not being complete which would mean it would over adapt it, it's going to become neurotic defensively mm -hmm. and understandably mm -hmm. so fidelity within a relationship will give the security for a man to step outside of his ego yes and, and to individuate yeah yes uh, that would link in with alchemy and that brings us back towards Jung again from Plato yeah. but without leaving Plato completely behind mm. Mm. yeah and if we move from that into the third painting yes indeed let's do that that, that yeah. would be good thank you Right, Paul, so uh, following on from Primavera, then yes. the uh, suggestion is that uh, this particular painting is a continuation of that. But there are some issues with it, aren't there, in the sense that it's very heavily and very obviously uh, ordained, should we say, with uh, Medici symbolism. Oh, there's definitely a nod to the Medicis in it. Yeah, very for strongly. Sure. Yeah. Yes, very strongly. And there are a lot of elements to the painting that would suggest that. And one is the, for example, the insignia um, on Athena's dress. That's one thing, like three overlapping mm. rings. Then there is the, uh, you might be better to comment on this, the weapon that yeah, she's the holding, yeah. the halberd. Yeah which might suggest power and status and authority. And, and they yeah. were, obviously, the Medicis were a very powerful banking family. Yeah, yeah. it's certainly contemporary yes. uh, uh, from that period. Hmm. Uh, and James did mention uh, to me that, that, that is, it is ceremonial. Again, that is something yeah. which can be specifically identified as being ceremonial for the Medicis yes. to do with the process of guarding. Yes. Now, obviously, if that were to be Minerva, Athena, then she's more traditionally associated with a sword That's for true. a clean cut, yes. so to speak. Yes. Um, but you mentioned something about uh, the centaur's head and the way that she's, she's taking hold of it. Yes, yes, I did. Just very quickly before I move on to that, uh, the uh, image of Athena is, is also uh, not just wisdom, but trade. There's many things, yeah. Well, many yeah. things, yes, yeah. of course, but there's another connection with the Medicis as well. It, it is, yeah, yes. absolutely. Yeah. And it would, would be a patron, <clears throat> uh, yes. um, therefore, or... If the Medicis had lived in the, the Greco-Roman Hellenistic mm, era, they mm. would have adopted Athena or Minerva. Oh, yeah. There are equivalent, not identical, yes. but equivalent, probably yes. as their patron goddess. Mm. Uh, yeah. But Hermes is also associated with business and trade. Yeah. yeah. So it just depends what you know what angle you want it to does. put on. And with respect to this, then the taking hold of the head, because you mentioned something to me that was very interesting about yeah, that. Yeah, well, the, the, the way that it it struck me was that it's very similar to Cellini, who, who was um, also uh, of the Renaissance, a Renaissance uh, sculptor, uh, and, and his sculpture of Perseus holding the Medusa's head. Yeah. It's reminiscent of that to me, yeah. the way that she's grabbed the hair of the centaur yeah. as if she has literally power over him. Yeah. And there has been some suggestion that the centaur himself, uh, Chiron, is synonymous really right. with what we would say is instinct yeah. and well, the lust drive. Well, Perseus used his shield, which was a gift to him. Mm. By from, Athena. Yeah, yes. that's right. So yes. uh, there's a potential link there yes. too. As was his helmet and his, his winged heels, which is, yeah. brings in another Mercury element. It, it does, yeah. it does indeed. Yeah. And then uh, there's what um, the centaur represents. I mean, as Chiron, mm. that is by Jungians usually associated with the act of healing. They do, yes. Um, but that may not be being represented here. There might be a lot yes. of Medici material here. Yes. But what it definitely is, is a feriomorph. Yes. You know, a half man, half animal. Mm. And um, in that sense, there's an elemental spirit there, which is yes. potentially rising into consciousness that may be ungovernable yes. in the form of instinct. Yes. And that has to be controlled in, in, in some sense. Yes. Uh, it could be that it, yeah. it's not as clearly mythological or depth psychological as the other two paintings i would suggest no it, actually it's strange strangely closer to to our own model and our, and our own way of thinking mm. about things and, and representing things so in that sense we could say that athena as wisdom uh, has the wisdom to know in in a way consciously cognitively what to do about 
the pressure that comes from the instinct, the instinct may, pressure, yeah. may be in the form of lust yes. and, and really yeah. they they do at one level they they not that this always happens but it's better if there is some kind of collaboration between the two otherwise yeah. we end up doing very impulsive things yes yeah so yeah it's, it's, mm. it's interesting to, know, to 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 ponder that uh, and of course the problem with representational psychodynamics is that we can think that we have fixed them by making a representation say in the form of art but there is always the problem potentially of being counterfixed by them into them mm. because once we make a representation if we're not careful we can be drawn into it and then anything which is latent that we haven't seen is also in association in a field sense to us. Yes. Uh, and as we said, this can be a problem with uh, writing mm. fiction, for example. The the beginning of a process like that, when we and we recommend that people do do this. Oh yes. That they they utilise fiction uh, as a way of working through natural meta instinctive narratives, yeah. into which complexes will naturally be drawn. Mm. Uh, the reason that they're going to be drawn into a narrative. Uh, creative writing narrative is as follows it's similar to a dream yeah. dreams are narratives the creative ego i will call it is similar to the dream ego insofar as the self-concept is invested in the dream ego state and in the waking ego state it is also invested in the creative ego state too so those complexes with which we identify or with which seek to identify with us dynamically will be drawn into a fictional narrative whether we're aware of it or not in the same way that a dream uh, when the waking ego is drawn into the dream ego those complexes attached to the ego come with it and they are obligated to be represented within the dream the same thing happens with a work of fiction and creative writing mm. and the problem can be if the energy which emerges through the creative process in the form of intuition and a drive state then is scooped up by the complexes every bit as much as it is by what we think of as being our own creativity mm. and at that point things like identification can occur mm. um, and these characters that appear to have been generated by us but are actually generated by the creative process mm. includes things which can bond with us mm. and pull us into an identification with them and then as they follow their narrative part of us is pulled with them mm. it also means that <clears throat> complexes as they are in us and not in the representational format are then effectively superpositioned in a field resonant way and they can draw on the strength of the uh, the characters that we've created to feed and strengthen them yeah. so we have to be very careful um, yeah. we've got to be very very careful about misdirecting a narrative by getting ahead of it because the positive side of that will be that the narrative will intend to correct for the complexes it will intend that because it's moving towards homeostasis and adaptation we mm. need this but if we become inflated by identification with the animation that some of these characters have mm. in representational form that is a clue that the complexes are fighting back within the narrative and the ego is being pulled into it mm. and then if we're lucky we'll still be able to contain it within the narrative and then it's like analyzing a dream and we say oh shit look at them, that mess I, I was down near caught in that yeah. you know? uh, but mm -hmm. if we're not aware of that and we're riding the wave of uh, reinforcements and affect that comes from being creative then we can fall into the, the trap of our own making yeah. through the projection into the narrative so that can happen too yeah so we need to be cognizant then don't we that there are all these competing subsystems for our libido yes at any one time mm -hmm. And that must be the job of the ego to be discriminating enough to, right. to, to know what's going on. And, and, you and that's point, really hard. You, well, you, you, yeah. you said that that's <clears throat> quite probably what is the depth psychology <clears throat> representation beneath the obvious surface structure. That this is the Medici. Yes. Um, the fact that there are mythological elements portrayed in there <clears throat> that are moved out of their original context. Yeah. That is a creative process, but it means there are things that are latent within those images that may not be aware, uh, if you like, to the commissioner of yes. the picture, yeah. which is not so much Botticelli, he's mm. the efficient cause, but maybe of the Medicis, and they then represent something and they don't know what the hell they've done. So you could say there are two commissioners. 
there's, there's, a there's a there's a there's a commissioner who thinks that they are directing the creativity yeah. of the artist yeah. and then there's what the artist is representing according yeah. to the external brief of the commission yeah. Yeah. but there is a third party involved mm. which is that which wants to represent itself yeah. uh, whether the the commissioner the mm. medicis in this case mm. is conscious of it or not do you think that's the most sense. important element it is because that's where all the mm. problems will arise yeah yeah. And it's like that with anything that's created, and it's like that with dream interpretation. Yeah. Um, it's the equivalent of internal projection through external projection into a creative media. Yeah. That we think we're doing it for this reason, but there are other forces which are acting simultaneously mm. um, that may or may not have the ego's best interest as ours. Or mm. if we're lucky, then we may just see the contending forces, and that will give the ego a chance to resolve them. Mm. Uh, but we have to be careful. And I think the problem with still images is that uh, it invites projection. Mm. Whereas a narrative, we can always reread the same part, you know, the, yes. the same book and get something else out of it uh, as an act of following a narrative. But a still image invites us to engage and to generate. At that point, intuition can overamp the stability of the ego. I, I would say there's a potential in that and, and that's a danger. And we get that in Santre, for example. Santre, if it works well, is a great projective medium, but it's still. It may imply movement, but it is still. It it's is. stationary. Mm. If it was a painting, it'd be still art. It'd be still art, yes, mm. absolutely. Mm. Um, or an installation, yeah, even, or, or something yeah. like, oh, which is not a painting, I, I yes. appreciate, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Um, and that can be good because we use it then like a mandala, and I don't necessarily mean the way that the Jungians use it, but the way, say, Tibetan Buddhists would use it, the Santre, which is that the contending forces are projected into that space and are confined and contained within that. Mm. And then we follow a process, if it were Tibetan Buddhism, of working with the representations in mm. there. The difference is the Tibetan Buddhist mandala is not random. It's not accessing the true unconscious. It's going through uh, a cultural representational system which has had centuries, if not millennia, of cultural repeated experience that makes it relatively safe. Mm -hmm. But when we work with something and we don't know what the heck is going to go into it, we have to have a very deep faith in homeostasis. And that's where complexes can become, you know, animated to the point of them making it a playground. And so when we work with Santre, we have to take some responsibility for, for the effects of what's projected in there. And we do with any kind of media like that, uh, if we're asking people to work through it. Now, for example, our students who are using um, uh, creative narrative, they're writing scripts, they they're writing books, yes. which is wonderful. Yes. And we support hmm. them in doing that. But there's definitely a process where it unfolds to the point where an initial animation and, and powering through of energy manifests and then there's the realization this is bigger than me and that's good because that's homeostasis that's saying yes you might have actually have let something out not only about you personally but about the the potential of the whole species at the level of the collective as young would uh, have described it those forces are very powerful your narrative had better deal with them properly don't leave it open-ended and don't identify with those characters particularly if they're tricksters because the trickster does not like to be identified mm. with. The trickster likes to be respected. Mm. If we identify with it, that brings about inflation. And the inflation means that the ego is unstable. And uh, with the right amount of focal pressure, it will burst. So we have to be really, really careful about that and how that unfolds. So that's just a, in a general, mm. uh, a general sense. Mm. So probably with that picture, then there's the superficial nod uh, to the medicis yes. as commissioners yeah there's then the efficient cause of the artist who has his own brief he may well have placed things in there and you could think of this in an almost and i mean this almost occult uh, sense thinking of the western version of the magic circle and how that would be used you would cre create a space within which to be safe within the uh, the dynamics that are operating around the boundary mm -hmm. of the perimeter of that circle uh, to ensure that the whole thing works safely. So um, some people who have depth psychological knowledge and were artists would represent things in there that yeah. would contain the forces. 
Oh, for sure. They were yeah. probably all doing it. Actually. Probably and all doing and it, yes, yeah. yes. And so the, it was like a nod to one another as well, almost like oh, a, yes. a secret society in and of itself. You I point, would imagine. You, well, you pointed yeah. that out to me and suggested that that would be the case, and yeah. I think that, that that's absolutely true. Yeah. Um, then in a kind of a pre-Freemason sort of a secret yeah. society era, yeah. uh, people like uh, artists would know and recognise mm. what they were doing. Yes. Uh, yeah. They would have to avoid the political correctness of the day. Yeah. Look what happened to Galileo. You know, um, they would, and others, the Spanish yeah. Inquisition, they would, they mm. would have to keep uh, that hidden. They would have to recognise signs and symbols within imagery yeah uh, this shares i know do you know yes yeah. i know too kind of thing okay let's keep that there make a living at the same time it, through yeah. patrons yeah um and that would be their individuation process and their adaptation to the times within which they lived yeah but when Jung said he thought that the gnostics were uh, precursors to deaf psychologists in yeah. some senses but the 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 religious iconography um fundamentally it was christian of course mm. probably overamped or over covered that over it certainly uh, overlaid it yes. it did yeah. yeah i would say the hermetic tradition with, uh, from the renaissance was closer late mm. medieval period and renaissance mm. and certainly the artists uh they were far freer um and we should look for evidence of that, I think, in Botticelli and in others of his contemporaries, mm. uh, how they work with the inertia and the resistance of their times to get the message through. Yeah. Yes. And they all concealed something of themselves, it seems, in, in, yeah. in their work. Yeah. We have it with Leonardo da Vinci and yeah. the Mona Lisa. We have yeah. it with Cellini, who apparently is a little self-portrait of it yeah. himself uh, in the back of... Um, Perseus's helmet yeah. so yeah. they all it was they all put their stamp on what they did in yeah. some way shape or form which yeah. I guess you could say yeah. um they kind of imbued it with something of themselves of their of their own spirit of their own creativity that would 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 go on regardless yeah. of how those paintings or those works of art were interpreted yeah so I'd say rather than uh, Gnostics being the precursors to deaf psychologists, it would be creative artists. And that mm. tradition is far, far more. It goes right back to the earliest of cave paintings yes. and carvings yes. on bones uh, and yes. just piling stones up as kerns, yeah. which even yeah. chimpanzees do. do. So yeah. that, that's way, way mm. earlier mm. than uh, a Gnostic interpretation of depth psychology. Yeah. It's more natural. It emerges out. It lends itself to to a platonic worldview mm -hmm. uh, and to the integration and, and private individuation that's locked within the creative process. Mm -hmm. um, whereas as soon as you bring in those inflationary elements of religion in whatever form, yeah. uh, particularly monotheistic ones, mm -hmm. then it's so deep, it's so lost beneath, beneath the weight of that, that I don't think that precursor that Jung thought he identified in Gnosticism is actually there. We, we, you could you could just disregard Gnosticism. You could even disregard alchemy and go straight to uh, art and yeah. you'll get there quicker. Yeah. 